All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, I invite you as always to take the attendance quiz. Uh, so this will be attendance quiz four. And the homework that we will have completed uh, is uh, the homework on John 3, but that's the fourth assignment. Uh, there's a little confusion. And I want to say if there's any ever any kind of problem with your grade or confusion, if you'll just email me, I'll, I can fix it uh, for you. So uh, anytime there's um, a grade different uh, than from what it should be, just let me know and I'm happy to uh, get that sorted out. We're going to look at two very important things today in terms of John 3. And the first question is a question that is fundamental for everyone. And that question is this, what does it take for God to save me? What do I have to do for God to save me? And if you're a believer, that's uh, one of the core questions that you uh, will ask. Uh, ha have I done what God wanted me to, to do? Uh, uh, how, how can I know? How can I know that he'll save me? And then a second question, and maybe a little bit more difficult question, is what exactly is saving faith? Is it, is it something that I do? Is it something that God does? Is it something that I and God do uh, together? Uh, what exactly is it uh, to turn from one's sin and to turn to Christ? And so John 3 is going to really help us with those questions uh, today. And that's uh, what we're going to look at. So as always, I want to start off, uh, and again, this is an opportunity to uh, uh, help with the extra credit uh, points. Uh, but what did you find interesting in the homework for today? That as you work through John 3, what did you surprise? What did you find surprising? What did you find encouraging? What did you find interesting? What questions did you have uh, as you worked through that homework for today? Yes. Yes, the, Jesus, um, in terms of his interaction with Nicodemus, uh, says, if you don't understand earthly things, and I suppose there he means simple things, how will you understand heavenly things? And it's interesting to me that when Jesus said that, that Nicodemus wasn't used to people talking to him that way. He was one of the 70 uh, members of the Jewish ruling council. He would be equivalent in our society to a sen senator, perhaps. And basically, Jesus says, is it, you know, that you're not really altogether there? Is there some kind of mental problem? And, and then he says, you know, Nicodemus, you really should understand these things, and you don't. And it's very interesting when we look at where Nicodemus ends up. Um, years later, he ends up defending Jesus um, when the council is about to pronounce judgment on him. And then uh, when Jesus dies, he's one of two people, uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who actually take Jesus' body down uh, from the cross, and they're both members of the Jewish ruling council. And so it's interesting to me that Jesus always interacts with people the way they need to be interacted with. And if they need to be kind of shaken and uh, called on the carpet for something, Jesus will do that. And we see that here with Nicodemus. And 
for Wednesday, we're going to look at Jesus' interaction with someone else, uh, the woman at the well. And on that occasion, uh, Jesus bends over backwards not to offend uh, her. So when someone kind of needs someone to be in their face and kind of uh, to speak to them just absolutely how it is, uh, Jesus will do that. And when Jesus needs to treat someone very kindly and uh, de deferringly, uh, Jesus knows how to do that too. But I, Marcus, I think you're exactly right. It is strange that uh, he says uh, to Nicodemus, you know, is, is there some kind of intellectual problem there that you're, you know, you really should be able to get these truths on your own from what you know of the Old Testament and somehow you're falling short. Uh, no, no, nobody had ever talked to Nicodemus that way before, but Jesus uh, was uh, more than willing to talk to him that way. And just to s step back in terms of the psychology of that, isn't it great when you have someone uh, who's close enough to you to speak to you uh, kind of the uh, unvarnished uh, truth uh, when you need to uh, have that. What else did you find interesting? What did you find challenging uh, in today's homework? Yes. Right, so uh, there's uh, the wind blows where it wills, and uh, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That seems very strange, does it not? Uh, that seems an odd thing uh, uh, to say, and coupled with that, uh, so is everyone who's born uh, of the Spirit. And it talks about being born of the water and born of the Spirit. What? What in the world does all that mean? Well, how many of you know that the Bible was originally written in a language other than English? How many of you know that? So the Bible is written in three different ancient languages. Uh, there are 1,189 chapters in the original. Uh, I think uh, 929 of those uh, chapters are written in Hebrew. Uh, the entire New Testament is written in Greek, and then there are a handful of chapters, uh, I think six uh, chapters, that are written in Aramaic, which is kind of a Hebrew-like language. Well, because that's true, there are some times where things are said in a language that when you translate that language, it kind of loses some of its punch. Um, do any of you are, are able to speak fluently a foreign language? Uh, any, anyone able to, to do that? Uh, what, what language? Uh, Portuguese. Portuguese. And I imagine that took uh, years for you to uh, become fluent in Portuguese. Or did you live in a Portuguese speaking country for a while? Yeah, so, you know, for mo most of the world, uh, uh, you know, the joke that uh, the rest of the world tells on Americans is they say, uh, do you know what you call uh, someone who speaks more than one language? And the answer is you call them polylingual. And do you know what you call someone who speaks one language? And you call them an American. Right, because we only, we only speak one language because our language happens to be the lingua franca of the world. And we go to an airport in Japan and we'll walk up to the counter and we'll start speaking English. And we expect someone to be able to understand uh, what we say. The rest of the world isn't like that. Uh, nearly every other country in the world um, People will speak more than one language and sometimes several languages. Well, because that's true, when you're learning a language, and Marcus, I imagine this is uh, 
true for you. One of the hardest things to get in a language is when people tell jokes. Uh, is that was that true for you? Because jokes and innuendo that all depends on nuance, and that's really hard to pick up. And if you ever have to occasion to um, speak to a group through an interpreter. Um, if you tell a joke, your interpreter is never going to tell the joke that you are telling. They're going to tell their own joke. Because they tell your joke, it's not going to be funny because it's not going to be fun. They're not going to get it in their language. Um, I, I spent five years uh, um, lecturing in a Korean language seminary, and uh, I had a very good uh, translator. But, uh, you know, translators will let you know, hey, we can't do jokes from your language to our language because they just won't work. The born of the wind and born of the spirit is something that both a Hebrew speaking audience and a Greek speaking audience would immediately get. And the reason that is, is because in both Hebrew and Greek, the word spirit Ruach in Hebrew and Pneuma in Greek, both those words mean wind and spirit. Wind and spirit. We get words in uh, English that are related to these words. Uh, um, pneumonia. That's why we spell pneumonia the way that we uh, spell it, because it has to do with breathing, right? But it's really the word spirit. And with this word ruach, um, often it's translated the spirit of god uh, we're going to see a passage uh, later this morning where it means spirit of god but it also means wind of god so when at the red sea the wind of god blows in this deadly dark uh, chaotic place and the waters are separated just like they were separated in original creation and then the light of God comes in the midst of those deadly waters and leads the people through. That's the Ruach of God that has made the dry land. But the Ruach, which can mean wind, can also mean spirit. And so you, you have this thing that the original writers would have understood, but because you and I are separated, by time and by a different language, it can be a little hard for us to get. And I suppose that's why God in his providence has raised up ministers and teachers to help us get insight on some of these uh, um, uh, finer points. But once we have the information, uh, then we can come to the text and um, uh, understand it very well. Well, let's look at the text this morning. Now, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, and he was a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So this is one of the 70 uh, rulers of the Jewish ruling council. Uh, he's being very polite uh, to Jesus. We know, we, we kind of are the leaders and we know that you're a teacher and that you've come from God. Uh, even calls him rabbi, which means my great one or something like that recognizes that Jesus is doing signs and he's being very polite. And Jesus almost immediately, this is a 
picture of the Jewish ruling council. This is the room in the uh, close to the temple where uh, Jesus would later be condemned by this ruling group. Jesus almost rudely answers Nicodemus and says, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is a very important person. He's like a senator, and you can imagine if a senator uh, showed up at your door at night and was speaking very politely uh, to you, might be tempted to uh, be uh, to use flattery in return. Jesus does not do that. In fact, Jesus doesn't even comment on anything that Nicodemus has said. Rather, He's saying to Nicodemus, the most important thing for you to know is that unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is coming as the representative of the people of Israel. And uh, in our day, he would be the equivalent of, you know, in religious terms, like a mega church pastor or something like that. He's a a principal teacher and Jesus is saying to him what you need to know Nicodemus is that you're not going to make it unless you're born again unless you're born again you are not Nicodemus you are not going to see the kingdom of God you're outside the kingdom of God unless you're born again and if you're born again you're inside the kingdom of God Jesus had a lot to say about the kingdom of God. Uh, we've already looked at one of those things. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, and then in his joy goes out and sells all that he has to get that field. What is the kingdom of God? It's the greatest good that could possibly come to a human being. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you're going to miss out on that kingdom unless you're born again. Now, there, there's an interesting thing about this word born again. Uh, clearly, it means born again because Nicodemus says, how can I... Uh, get back into my mother's womb and be born a second time. That's impossible. That cannot happen. Clearly, Nicodemus is understanding this word, uh, anothen. We're going to see the word in Greek. But there's something true of this word that might help us uh, grapple a little bit better with what Jesus is intending by this word. And so the word that Jesus is using here is this word, anothen. And uh, this, this is the word, be born in Greek. And this word, anothen, comes from a word that can mean up or again. So... This part of the word, that's what it means. And then this part of the word means from. So when you come to the word anothen in the original language, it can mean again. That's clearly how Nicodemus is uh, taking it. Uh, Nicodemus has a Greek name. Apparently Nicodemus uh, knows Greek. Apparently this conversation happened in Greek. And Jesus says, unless someone is born, is begotten, is fathered. And Nicodemus is taking it this way, but the word also can mean this, from above. Unless someone is born from above. Nicodemus, you're a leader of the Jewish people, but know this, unless you're born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And so you and I as readers, when we come to this text, we need to ask, well, which one of these meanings or 
perhaps both of these meanings is Jesus intending by what he says to Nicodemus. And so just to make the point um, uh, that this word can mean those things, uh, the word anothen is used 13 times uh, in the English translations. And notice that the majority of those times, it actually is translated from above. A, f a few times, and in fact, it's only the times in our chapter here is it translated again. And the same thing is true in the Old Testament. Um, all of these... Uh, all of these are being translated from above. And you can see that from above is the normal way that you translate this word anothen in Greek. And just to prove that, I want you to see this with your own eyes. This is, this is our word unless someone is born again. And so we see it there. And then uh, we see it again. Um, to be born again. But look at this use. The one, so this is the word D, and this is the word coming, the one coming, and where, how are they coming? The one coming, anothen. And notice how all translations translate anothen in verse 31. In verse 31, anothen can't be translated again. In verse 21, it's talking about people who come from the dirt, that is Adam, who are born from Adam. The one who is from the dirt is from the dirt and, the, and speaks from the dirt, but the one from heaven, the one coming from heaven is over all. There's a dirt man and there's a God man. And it's the God man who is important. And we see that the text is picking up this use of anothen. Now, that's impossible, almost impossible for us to see in English. There's no way to translate it in a way where it connects the text. That's why God is raising up uh, preachers for us and, and teachers so we can see this connection. But once we have the connection, then we can ask the right question. And the right question is this. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Unless one is born anothen, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Unless he is born, and if it means from above, well, let me ask you a question. We, we started uh, in chapter 1 with that whole question, is it, is it God's doing or is it man's doing? And we saw that in chapter 1, in the same sentence, it's whoever believes, to them he gives the power to become the children of God, who are born not from bloods, not from the will of the flesh, not from the will of a man, but who are born from God. And you can hear the sovereign grace people in the background saying, yes, yes. And then you hear the free will people saying, but it's whoever believes, yes, yes, and it's in the same sentence. And we see that same truth being taught here. For if you were favoring the sovereign grace side, that uh, to be a believer, it takes some kind of act of God, well, this would be a great verse, would it not? And yet this verse is in the same chapter that verse 16 is in that says, whosoever believes. 
I think that's what, what that's teaching us is this, that if you come to the Bible and you want to preach some kind of hyper-Calvinism, that is a view if God wants to save someone, uh, then don't even speak at all about a person willing or deciding that if God wants to save someone, he'll, he'll do it himself. If that's where you come to the text and believe, there are all kinds of verses that contradict that statement. And orthodoxy has always rejected hyper-Calvinism. But at the same time, if you come to the text and you want to teach a hyper-free will view, that is what church historians have called Pelagianism, where somehow the fall doesn't affect human will and that you can decide on your own apart from God to believe. Well, it's clear the text doesn't teach that either. The text seems to hold intention that your choice counts, that your choice is real. It isn't some kind of uh, pseudo choice it isn't some kind of fake choice it's a real choice and to be saved you have to decide to be saved but at the same time the text is saying you need to ask the question of why you're willing to believe did that come from you or did that somehow come from God and so, just as in chapter 1, where you get both of these truths, in chapter 3, you get both of these truths. Jesus says, unless someone is born a nothing, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's clear that Nicodemus understands that as being born again. So, the question that I want to ask is, is there anywhere in the Bible, in the Old Testament, because Jesus expects Nicodemus to have known this, is there anywhere in the Old Testament where you find the idea of being born again or being born from above? Is there any passage that speaks in language like that? And there is a passage. There is a very important passage. And it's actually the passage that describes the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their forefathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. What is the new covenant? I will give you a new heart. What does that look like? Ezekiel 36, we're going to uh, in time, look at that in depth. But Ezekiel 36 is explaining uh, Jeremiah 31. What does that look like? Give me a, a picture of what that looks like. And this is God's picture. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the Ruach, in the Spirit in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. Now I want you to imagine something with me. You lay your head down on your pillow at night, you fall into blissful sleep, and all of a sudden in the middle of the night you wake up and God is there. And God has gotten you uh, out of your bed and has taken you to a place and it's completely dark except for the presence of God and God puts you down in the middle 
of a field full of dead bodies. And there are people who have long been dead. Uh, the bones are scattered. There are uh, dead bones everywhere. You're standing there with God and you're looking at the bones. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were standing there with God and I'm looking out over dead people, I'm going to be terrified. I don't know how you are, but these are my thoughts. What have I done? God, God's going to kill me. God knows my sin. God knows the ways that I've been a hypocrite. God's going to kill me. And all of a sudden you're standing, can I get a witness? Anybody else? You know, maybe you're not that fearful, but that, if I'm doing this, that's how I'm feeling right now. This is what the text says. So imagine, and it, it says there were a large number of bones. I think there are even more bones than this. And um, this is what God tells Ezekiel to do. Uh, he asked him a question, can these bones live? Now, I'm still terrified, but God just has asked me what seems like a pretty stupid question. Can these bones live? And, you know, if someone is going to be a smart aleck, they would say something like, well, of course they can't live. They're dead. Ezekiel knows better than be a smart aleck with God, and so Ezekiel says the one thing, the one right answer is, says, O oh Lord, you know whether they can live. And the Lord says to Ezekiel, this is what I want you to do. I want you to preach to these dead people. I want you to prophesy. That's what prophesy means, to forth tell uh, the will of God. I want you to prophesy over these bones. Now I want you to imagine you're standing there. God's, you know, you're five, 15 seconds away from thinking God was going to kill you. And now God is telling you to preach to dead people. I mean, what do you say? Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you feel God tugging at your heart, just, just get up. Yes, come down. Yes, I see that radius. Yes, the buses will wait. Come, come. God has told you to preach to dead people. Dead people don't respond to the things of God, do they? Ezekiel starts preaching. And the text tells us that as he started preaching, that bones started coming together. Can, can you imagine what that was like? You know, you're preaching, you're kind of, I don't know if he did it emotionally or if he did it half-heartedly. But he's preaching, and as he preaches, these bones start inching their way back together. And as he preaches more, organs start to grow back inside of these skeletons. And as he preaches more, these skeletons grow muscles and 
our skin and the text tells us but there was no ruach in there so I don't know if they were like laying on the ground still or if they were standing there but they weren't alive like they had skin and they had flesh and they had organs but they didn't have a ruach and so God tells Ezekiel preach to the ruach and say to the ruach breathe on these slain that they may live And Ezekiel does it. And they go from being these kind of half-dead people to being a willing, able army to do God's will. Now, how many would you, would you grant that that is a weird story? I mean, do you think do you think Ezekiel as he's preaching and he sees these bones coming together and these hearts growing back and and uh, the muscles and the skins, do you think Ezekiel was tempted to say, Man, I am a good preacher? Or do you think Ezekiel was thinking God is doing something here. If we were reading this in the original language, our minds would be drawn back to Genesis 2. And we've talked about this before, have we not? Um, when it says that the Lord God fashioned the Adam as dust from the ground. And then it says, and the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the Adam turned into a living soul. He, in Greek, emphusiaoed him. He innatured him. He put something inside of the dirt man that converted the dirt man into a real man. Well, I want you to look at this word emphusiao with me. Do you see it appears here? In Genesis 2 7, do you see that? Do you see that that word is emphusiao? It's what we read in Ezekiel 37. Look at the New Testament. It tells us that that word emphusiao appears in John 20 22. Now, as intelligent readers, what we should do is not look that verse up, right? Who can tell me what John 20, 22 says? This is Jesus. The day that he rose from the dead, John 20, 22 tells us that Jesus did something really weird to his disciples. He's meeting with them for the first time. He's showing them uh, the wounds from the nails. He's encouraging them to believe. And then it says he did something really weird. What did he do? He breathed on them. He emphusiaoed them. Now, remind me, who is emphusiaoing here? 
isn't it Yahweh who is making the dirt man a real man? And who is emphasizing here? Isn't it the Spirit of God coming into an otherwise lifeless body? And now we have the God-man Jesus coming to his disciples and he's emphusioing them. He's breathing into them and he says, receive the Ruach. Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, if you want to see the kingdom of God, know this, that you're going to have to be born again. You're going to have to be born from above. This is the thing that David cries out when he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. And if you know the context of Psalm 51, this is, David after he's committed adultery with Bathsheba and after he's murdered her husband and been confronted by Nathaniel the prophet. And David is saying, God, if I'm going to be a good person, then you need to create in me a clean heart. And you may or may not know that that word create this is Genesis 1-1, Bereshit bara Elohim. Remember when we read it in class the other day, in the beginning Elohim created, he bara the heaven and the earth. And look at what David prays. Create in me a lev tahor, a heart pure, a pure heart. Didn't Jesus say the pure in heart will see God how do you how do you get a pure heart do you do you make it on your own do you pull your bones together do you recreate your skin and flesh or do you come helpless to God and say God I am spiritually dead I am without form and void darkness is over the faith of my deep and if I'm going to have a pure heart oh God create that heart in me and isn't that the exact promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31? I will give you a new heart. I'll give you a clean heart. Jesus answered, said to him, Truly I say, unless one is born a nothen, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Paul says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation, a kine ketesis. He has been remade by God. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. This is what the Bible is teaching about us as people before that event. We have at the core of who we are a spiritually dead heart. And to live with God, we've got to have a new heart. And that new heart is not something that we can make on our own. That new heart comes from God. Our life is a life of following and falling into sin, ups and downs. Over the course of our life, there's going to be a marked uh, growing in the things with God. And then when we see Jesus in heaven, that... Uh, down payment of the new heart will become the totality of who we are. That's what the Bible's teaching. The Bible does not teach sinless perfection on earth. We all are tainted with evil. Uh, uh, Christians are going to have times of following God greatly and times of failure. The Bible's very clear on that. But the Bible is saying that the ultimate outcome of that seeing Jesus in heaven we're transformed into his likeness and this new heart that we get becomes the totality of who we will be so the most important question any person can ask is do I have the new heart 
am I part of the group that has the new heart or do I have an old heart? Is the core of who I am this or is the core of who I am this? How do you know? Well, uh, how, you, how you know is verse 16. Whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. Yes, this is an act of God, but how do you know if you're in or not? Well, do you believe? Are you trusting in the goodness of Jesus to give you his righteousness, recognizing that you have nothing but sin and wickedness? If the answer to that question is yes, then you are saved. And if the answer is, I don't know, then the most important thing for you to do is to find out. Are you trusting in Jesus? And someone would say, well, you know, you said it's an act of God. Look, God is saying that choices are real. If you believe whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He doesn't say, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, provided that you're elect, will be saved. He doesn't say that. He says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. But he also says, Jesus says, unless you're born in nothing, you can't see the kingdom of God. It seems to me, to a lot of people, that the Bible is asking us to believe both those truths that choices matter, that choices are real, and that somehow, in some unexplained way, that this is an act of God. That both these truths are true. Nicodemus doesn't understand. How can a man be born when he's old? What does Jesus say? Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless you are born of the water, I, I suppose that means natural birth, uh, part of being born, a woman's water breaks, and you can call that being born of water. Unless you're born the first time and then born of the Ruach, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of Ruach is Ruach. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again and nothing. The Ruach blows where it wills. The Pneuma blows where it wills. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Pneuma. I don't think Nicodemus got that at first but I think he got it eventually that he realized that whatever the new covenant is talking about is talking about coming to people who are spiritually dead spiritually dark spiritually without form and void spiritually under the waters of judgment and the new covenant is God saying, let there be light. And when God says, let there be light, there was light. And God saw that the light was good. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. As powerful as that truth is, it does not negate the fact that that offer is open to anyone. That there's a whosoever will associated with that promise. And that's what John 3 is asking us to believe. I see that our time has ended, so I'll see you on uh, Wednesday.